our YouTube channel at the end. Um, usually takes me, you know, about a day or so to get it up there, but um, definitely by this time tomorrow it will be posted. So uh, welcome to those of you joining us on YouTube as well. So this is phenomenal to see so many people in here tonight. I'm um, just letting you know, because this is a webinar, everyone is muted, your cameras are off. Um, and a little bit later, I will put the link to our YouTube channel in the chat so that you can see. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box. With this many people in the room, that chat's gonna be flying and it's really easy to miss questions. So if you have a question, please use that Q&A box. That lets everybody else see your questions and, and it also makes it easier for us to find all the questions there at the end. So at the end of the presentation, we will do our best to answer as many questions as we possibly can. Again, this many people in the room, I have a feeling there's gonna be a lot of questions. So um, to be respectful of everyone's time, we will answer as many as we can. If we don't get to your question, please feel free to email me and between the two of us, we will get you an answer. Um, so for your safety, you should only be able to see what I post in the chat, but just in case, don't click on any links other than anything that I may post. Um, we are the Conservation Foundation. We are the ones sponsoring these webinars. Um, they are offered to the public for free, but we do encourage you to consider a donation or membership. The more people we have attending, the more it does cost us to run these. So at the end of the webinar, you'll be taken back to the, to, um, um, Kelsey, I apologize. I think I forgot to change it to your website. I think it's still going back to the Conservation Foundation's website. Um, but I will make sure in the follow-up emails that we will have your website as well. Okay. Um, so if you are enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to make a donation to help keep us running. So this will also make you a member so you can enjoy the wide variety of members only stuff that we offer. So just to let you know, Thursday, we're going to have a webinar on Fox River Dam. Should we live with them and can we live without them? Even though it's specifically going to be about the Fox River Dams, it is going to apply the information provided will apply to anyone living in a watershed that does have dams. So um, then on Monday, May 25th, also at 1 p.m., we're going to have a webinar on nature-based play. So we will have um, another guest host joining us from Hitchcock Design Group who works on nature-themed playgrounds. So that'll be another fun one as well. All right, so without further ado then, Thank you again to all 370 people who are in the room. It is so nice to have this kind of wonderful response from everyone. Um, and we are so grateful to all of you for joining us tonight. So now I will turn this over to Kelsey. I will turn my camera off. I will be here manning the chat and the Q&A. So um, if you have any questions or anything, again, please feel free to use that Q&A box. Take All right. Away, so you want me to, I start screen sharing uh, now, right? Yep. All right. I can do that. Uh, here we go. Do, do, do. Oops. That's supposed to be up. My apologies, everybody. A little clunky to start, but here we go. Um, my name's Kelsey. I'm with Possibility Place Nursery. And tonight, uh, for those of you that have not heard me speak before, uh, I am going to be talking about uh, converting landscapes to uh, native planting, or at least native incorporated plantings. So uh, I've been doing this for uh, almost 40 years, and um, we've been working with native plants almost from the beginning when uh, we started Possibility Place back in the late 70s. And through our years of experience and tremendous errors uh, in plant use, we have kind of built a, a reputation for being able to help people place proper species in, uh, in their yard in productive ways and to incorporate natives into existing landscapes to not only enhance their beauty, but to help support local ecosystems. And this talk that we're going to be hearing tonight has a lot to do with transitioning those gardens and the challenges to transitioning that some people will experience. Some of you are probably very familiar with native plants and could probably do it in your sleep. But for others, it can be very daunting because there's a lot of information 
and to absorb it and properly get your plants to perform in your yard can be very taxing and frustrating and sometimes it drives people away. So what I'm going to try and touch on is that transition and some easy steps that we can we can go through. And uh, as you can see, it's called the big switch. And uh, well, let's get started. And when it comes to transitioning to native plants, it's usually a mis uh, misunderstood concept because people think when you go native, it's all or nothing. You have no in between. So it's either you're a native person or you're not. And a majority of Americans turn their nose up and say, nuts to that because I'm not gonna learn more about what I already know about gardening. But the reality is, is that when you go to use native plant material, there is no hard and fast rules. Incorporating native species, like you see the podophyllum here in this picture, is just that. You're incorporating it into an existing landscape that you that may already exist on your property. You can fully embrace it and 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 tear out the sod and and do all that kind of thing, or you can just put bits and pieces in. Every little bit helps local ecosystems. And when people think native, most people when you're driving around, you see those little gardens that are imprisoned in a corner, and there that's the child uh, you know came home from school and said, "Mommy, Daddy, I've got these prairie plants. We're going to put them in our yard." And they're like, okay, so they build a little box and they imprison them someplace and that's the native garden. When the reality is, is that there are so many native species that are so beautiful to use in ornamental settings that they're often overlooked because of the tag of native. And so getting past that misunderstanding that is just a matter of incorporation at, at the least, you know, full conversion at the best, there are every color on the scale for people to, to utilize. Now, that being said, when people are considering going native, what are we up against? When I get phone calls at my nursery, um, you know, uh, about how do I address certain problems in my yard or on my particular site or at my project? And a lot of them, they already have stuff like this. And it's an interesting kind of dilemma for me because I see this as an opportunity to go, you know, in, in a very big way, but this is a, you know, urban site and these little islands of imprisonment aren't just for natives. A lot of times they put these things out in, in parking lots and, and such, and they imprison the people for their ice cream, you can see up there, and then they imprison the plants, you know, down away from them in the ditch because, you know, why not? and they mow the ditch because clearly those people are going to hop the fence and go have a picnic. So you have to be aware that when people call in, they're like, well, what do I do? Sometimes it can be very, very challenging because what do you tell this particular client? Or, or how about this particular one? Every parking lot in America. You know, the way things are done are detrimental to plants and sometimes there are no good solutions. And when they do this time and time and time again, you end up with really bad results. Um, you know, this is uh, a version of Juniperus communis that was used in a parking lot and clearly it did not love life here. You know, it's, it, it's unfortunate, but this happens often. And they're like, well, it was native, it should have made it. This is almost as unnatural as you can possibly get. And it gets worse. You have people, that put a native tree. This is a red maple, which is in, in, you know, a, a, a new construction, which please, if you're considering red maple anywhere from where you're listening, please, for the love of God, don't put it in your parkway. It likes moisture. It likes well-drained, uh, well rich soil with, with a high water table. It'll perform fantastic there. But in the parkway, uh, nine and a half times out of 10, it goes very, very wrong. And this particular one um, is down the street from where I used to live uh, on the west side of Chicago. And uh, if you can see the stakes, every time the tree died, it got a new stake. And uh, this was at number four. You can see one, two, three green ones and that nice wood one there. And uh, it ended up, I believe, it, the last one was, there were six stakes around it because clearly 
it wasn't enough stakes around the tree to keep it alive. So uh, it's just something that it, 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 even under the you know best conditions, some plants don't like it where you're putting them. Or in other cases where, um, why? I mean, why? This is, I realize people do this for privacy, uh, but then why are you mowing the ditch on the outside? Uh, you know, the, the families clearly are not going to utilize this for a soccer game or something like that. It, it's just a tremendous, you, you know, uh, we'll call it underutilization of space where natives can be embraced in a low profile, you know, pollinator mix or something could have been utilized here. Maybe a, a better, you know, screening border could have been put in. It, it, it's, it, you see this all often and it becomes a very, uh, we'll call it uh, missed opportunity. Or you have this where this landscape's not to scale to the home. There's a magnolia in a plant prison about 300, or excuse me, about 150 yards from the front door. That thing's only six feet tall and when you're that far away and I'm only on the other side of the road and it looks tiny. When, when you have this kind of thing and when you're trying to embrace it and I realize it's not native, but when you try to embrace these, um, <laughs> these plants and you plant them in places that they, they're just not suited for, it, it just, it, it's a common refrain and it's repeated time and time and time again, or in some cases, not at all. You end up with um, three acres of mowed goodness. Uh, the only shade in the yard supplied by uh, what you can see there on the left-hand side is a six-foot-tall fountain that did work. I, I will give them credit for that, but it, this is another kind of lost opportunity. And I realize people's tastes run with landscaping. Fair enough. But when you have these kinds of underutilization of space and you're out in the middle of a cornfield, you end up with other types of environmental problems in a yard. So when you don't have borders and shade and nature, it can really diminish the value of your property in the long run. Now, some of the people that were just photographed will call me up or uh, they'll talk to me after a talk or something like that. And they'll simply say, natives aren't pretty. They're not pretty, they've never been pretty, they're weedy, they're out of control monsters. And when they put them in my yard, they go in the neighbor's yard and they yell at me. Well, the same can be said for things like, uh, you know, Creeping Charlie and everything else that people are like, oh no, it was not a problem to begin with, but it clearly ended up being one. So I always ask them this, find me the non-native. Of these six pictures, one of them is not native, at least, excuse me, at least one of them is not native to north, northern, uh, the northern half of Illinois. So when I show them this picture, they look at it and I want to say maybe one in 10, maybe two in 10 can pick out the non-native for uh, anybody that can. My head is off to you, but um, is everybody got their guess in? I'm guessing yes. It is of the bottom right hand corner that is a crab that is not native. And uh, the rest of them, uh, the one in the middle lower is Physocarpus opulifolius or nine bark, that's native straight species. On the left, on the bottom, is Sambucus pubens or red elder. Uh, the top right is Oh, oh my God, it just went out of my head. Oh, uh, uh, Prunus pumila or sand cherry. Uh, the one in the middle that looks like Budlia, it definitely is not. That is Amorpha fruticosa. Uh, interesting thing about that plant, it is one of the primary hosts for the silver spot skipper butterfly. So anybody doing a little butterfly gardening, that plant surely helps. And on the left is kind of the flavor bush of the year. That is Aronia melanocarpa. For anybody out there that loves to juice things, you got a winner right there. But when I'm told they're not pretty, I, when I pop this up there, I go, well, this doesn't prove anything. It's like, okay, fine. It doesn't prove anything. So what, what, the, what questions, what problems do you have with natives that maybe I can, I can help with, I ask them. And I say, well, 
they go into kind of a laundry list of things and it, it falls along these lines. The first one being conventional landscaping thought about species. They say, my grandmother did it this way, my, you know, my dad did it this way, and now I'm doing it this way. And every time that they, they talk about that, their grandmother lived in South Carolina, their dad ended up living in Pennsylvania, and now they live in Chicago. And those are three very different places. So the things that grandma got away with are not the things that you're going to be getting away with. But because certain cultural aspects of the way we use plants follow us around the country, it becomes, uh, it becomes a kind of a, a trope that when you bring things from one place to another, they, there's a certain rate of failure. And when we are using cultivated species, a lot of them that are good in the South that are being touted, uh, like the myriad of, of hydrangea species that you know people want to bring up here but constantly have died, it, you, you end up you know, trying to get people to utilize the native equivalent. And even when you do, they're like, oh, that's beautiful, but I still wish I had my grandmother's. It's like, okay, but this one's working, it's living, it is giving you exactly what you're looking for. And it's a native species that's contributing to the landscape and the environment as a whole. So there's that. The next one is, is that information is very, very hard to get. Well, the information on natives has improved. Uh, there are uh, organizations uh, like the Conservation Foundation. Um, you know, there are individuals like Doug Ptolemy out of Delaware. There are, uh, you know, there's more and more nature shows like uh, BBC has put out that Earth, uh, um, uh, my God, documentary, excuse me, I'm having a brain fart, my apologies. Uh, and these have really helped bring native species into the, the general consciousness of at least the interested gardener. And when you are able to get that information, there, there seems to be an awakening to, to native plant species. However, not all the information that is available is consumable for the normal person. Uh, us, you know, we, in the industry, you end up yeah, fielding calls that deal more on the common name and that's very frustrating because most of us operate on the Latin name and so you have a communication breakdown and it becomes frustrating for the gardener and the most important thing I can tell you is that when you are trying to get this information I, I assure you that the professionals are being very as patient or normally as possible to make sure that that information comes across as clear as is, is possible so that you can utilize it in your gardening decisions. Now, speaking of experts, uh, like Doug Ptolemy and, uh, and, and my company and others like us uh, that have utilize native, uh, native species for very different reasons, um, you know, uh, across the, the, the growing spectrum and offering it to the public and the importance of it as our environment uh, moves forward through time is they're not as available uh, to people. We're hard to find sometimes. Uh, people aren't always willing to talk and these types of events like we're having tonight, um, there are organizations like the Nature Conservancy, um, the, uh, or, yeah, the Nature Conservancy, the Conservation Foundation, the Audubon uh, Society, they have people and experts, uh, and depending on where you live, um, the U of I extension, uh, there's going to be information that might be available to you to help you with at least solve some native plant issues um, that you're looking to have it, uh, or looking to uh, troubleshoot in your yard. What species grow right for me? And these experts, while they have become more accessible, there's still not a ton of us out there that can answer direct questions all the time. So um, when you find one, share him or her with your friends who have similar problems. And those people tend to make light the work of finding out what species are good for you. 
Um, and it's like it was telling you, like, you, it, oh, my goodness, my apologies again. Uh, like the picture of the parking lot, people expect natives to just go in the ground, never worry about them again. They are, they're just going to grow. They're just going to be perfect the way they are. And I don't have to do a thing. Well, that is almost as far from the truth as you can get for an urban type landscape. For those of us that have uh, somewhat uh, more land that are, that are able to let things kind of go more natural, yes, there's definite opportunities. As long as I have developed a plant palette that is appropriate for my particular location and the site conditions match the material that's going in the ground or I'm trying to revitalize populations that are there, there is definitely an opportunity for let them, just let them run wild. But for the home garden, they are no different than any plant that you're going to put in the ground, especially for that, that uh, maturing process. When you buy them, they're typically smaller. Uh, native plant growers tend to put plants out in pint size rather than gallons, mostly because people are trying to cover more ground with them. Uh, Native plant growers tend to work with homeowners on the square foot basis, not on an individual plant here, plant there kind of basis, because we're looking for coverage. You're trying to get a small environment installed rather than a particular plant to go here and a particular plant to go there. Now, the real, uh, what's realistic about it is, is that you need to understand that if you're going to garden, it's just regular standard gardening and you're going to utilize a native plant, they're no different than some of the ornamentals that you would put under the same circumstances. You're just utilizing a native plant in that way. And they're not going to act like they would in nature. Sometimes they're going to get very, very big. Sometimes they're not going to get as big as you would hope they would. So understanding that the, the species that you're choosing matters. If you have heavy clay soil, planting butterfly weed may not be the best choice. However, planting maybe common milkweed or prairie milkweed might be a much better choice for the same outcomes. Maybe not, you won't get your orange, but you'll still get the butterfly, you'll still get the monarch help, you'll still, you'll still get that benefit in the yard for a very beautiful plant, but it's not quite what people expect. So having a realistic expectation and minimizing you, the, the, uh, <laughs> the thought that once I put it in the ground, I just never have to think about it again and understand that the opportunity is definitely there. But if you're going to garden conventionally, you should treat them at least semi-conventionally. Just tone it down on the fertilizer. And then you have to keep this in mind too. Natives are native because they come from a region that you live in, all right? Illinois uh, is part of the upper Midwest, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, parts of Minnesota, parts of Iowa, you know, uh, parts of Missouri. We all share, there's a common thread of species that run through these areas. However, if you have big blue stem here, in Illinois, it's a big plant. It gets seven, eight feet tall. If you have big blue stem in Kansas, it gets four feet tall. And it matters where the material comes from. So no, understanding that they have become trendy, so people are starting to market them from all over the place, it really matters uh, that you utilize as much of a local producer as you can. There are many of us out there, sometimes we're not all that hard to, or excuse me, sometimes we're hard to find, but when it comes to uh, utilizing a native R and its place, understand what a native R is. It is a cultivar, plain and simple. It is nothing more than a developed plant, has diminished genes, it's, uh, it is, I'm told it is improved. However, if uh, anybody on, on, this, uh, on this talk tonight remembers, say the, late 90s, early 2000s, when echinacea was all the rage. And remember one called Magnus? And I, I don't know if that one's still on there. It was tiny little petals, gigantic seed head. And as soon as it said seed, you got weird little seedlings all over the place. 
it's just a cultivar. And they're typically when they start to seed, they seed out and they cause, we'll call it confusion in the garden. Like where did that plant come from? If you can, and you're going to use natives, you're much better off using seedling, uh, seed produced straight species natives. If they react better with, uh, you know, with your local environment, your local pollinators, your local faunal interactions will be improved with straight species. Now, that being said, if you know where you live, it's the start of understanding what species will work for you. So, and I know that was a hard transition. <laughs> Sorry about that. But if you live up on top of the hill over here, um, and you the species that you're going to be successful with there are going to be very different than if you live down by this wetland down here at the bottom. Understanding that you know, the place where you live matters for the plants that you choose it is really shocking to a lot of homeowners because they don't, they look at their yard and they'll be like, yeah, you know, I really want to put a prairie in here, but they live in a woodland and they have a woodland soil profile. And if they're lucky enough to have a much older home, the soil may be un, or well caught less damaged and able to support those types of species. So understanding that everybody lives kind of on a sliding scale you're 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 gonna live in uh, you know uh, you're gonna live in shade or sun or you're you're sand you're in sandy very dry soil or just a mucky wet mess that you know that is the, always been the backyard but you also live like kind of halfway in between some of these things part of your yard's gonna be sunny part of your yard's gonna be dry it matters because the plants that are going to thrive for you are going to be different in parts of your yard than in others. But it also matters where you are. If you live in, again, if you live in a woodland type area, you're going to want to make sure that the, the, the plant palette that you're looking at is more on the woodland end. It, that's going to involve things like ginger and some of your bromes, uh, your alimus, uh, the, uh, uh, the bottle brush grass. I'm sorry that floated out of my head for a second. You know, your native ferns those are going to thrive under those conditions. Whereas if you live in a prairie and you plant those things, uh, that's not always a winner. And you need to be aware that there is that sliding scale and you need to identify the conditions of your site before you start making plant choices. So any plant that you choose to put in the ground needs to be adjusted, uh, not adjusted, excuse me, that you, <laughs> excuse me. The plants that you choose to put in the ground need to be adjusted to that site. So if you have a wet, you know, just a, an area that will not drain, you need to look and embrace species that are going to be very, very happy under those conditions. Changing a site to match your plant is never going to perform as well as looking at your site and developing a plant palette that is suited for it. So you want the right plant for the right place, not the right place for the right plant. So you're not choosing to fix your site. Your site's not broken. Well, if it's built since about 1990, there might be some, we'll call it uh, augmentation and fragmentation that needs to happen to your soils, but you're going to be much more successful in the long run if you match your plants to the site rather than the other way around. And this is a prime example of this. Uh, this is a McMansion. Uh, there are many like it, but this was my client's. And when I pulled up to the house, I had, I, I had to call him and say, do you have the right company? Because I'm looking at your house and this is, uh, what I sell does not match what I'm looking at. And he said, no, no. I want to do it different. I want, I want it. I don't like what I've got. I said, okay, I can talk to you. So I pulled in and I started looking around and it had the same kind of problems that any garden that has been put in for a while. Uh, it had hostas in full sun. You can see them uh, toasting out there on the top. Uh, it had 
uh, sun shrubs underneath uh, underneath eaves. It had uh, very peculiar uh, prune jobs and plants just seemingly placed at random uh, around, even like the dwarf yew hedge up here, you know, on the side of a garage that nobody ever looks out at. It, 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 it was problematic and he was shoveling gravel when I came up and when I pulled in, I noticed this plant right here. And I had, the, when I got out of my car, I looked at this thing for at least 10 minutes. Didn't have a clue as to what it was. Uh, I, he, he came over, he says, what are you looking at? I said, it looks like a nuclear bomb went off in your yard and it made a little mushroom shrub. And I don't know what that is. And he goes, was well, that a problem? I go, well, normally I don't get stumped, but um, let it go. Don't prune it, don't do anything to it. And let's see what it turns out to be. Now, I wish I had a picture. Uh, I do not. It turns out that this is I call my burnum. And when he stopped pruning it, it grew six feet that summer and flowered for the first time. And they'd been in that home for 10 years. I see, he goes, it's beautiful. He goes, it's weird looking, but it's beautiful. He goes, he goes, I did I didn't even know it flowered, and we've lived here for that long. He goes, why did they ever prune this thing? Because when I got here, I just kept on doing the same thing because that's what I thought you were supposed to do. And these, this kind of goes back to that trope we were talking about earlier is when I see, when I move in, is what, oh, well, the, clearly this is the way it's supposed to be. Well, it ended up being quite beautiful. Weird looking, but beautiful. And the things that we did to his yard kind of transformed it into something completely different. And now he, <laughs> he allowed me to go a little crazy. I planted uh, six oak trees in the horseshoe here. And keep in mind, uh, there, oh, you, you know what, excuse me, uh, very quickly, if you look over the top of the uh, uh, blue car on the left-hand side, that is the Black Hall Viburnum. Um, it was only as tall as the garage door. It is now higher than the roof line in this particular picture. Now, that being said, we ripped out all the ewes. We put in a native grass border with oak trees. And we know that those oak trees in 25 years are gonna be shading out a lot of the native grass border, which is fine. We have planned, you know, at the time we had planned for this. We understood that for the next 20 years, we're gonna have a nice grass bed. We're gonna have beautiful pollinators and everything like that. And when the time comes, it, we will transition from a full sun prairie planting to something different over time. And they were happy with it. It was, it was stunningly beautiful. We got a lot of this growth happened in just 16 months. It was one of the fastest, uh, uh, <laughs> it was one of the fastest turnarounds I've ever seen with native plants. And we did this all with pints. Every single one of these, Ex excuse me, all the herbaceous material. The shrubs that you see there were all done with five gallon. The trees were all one inch. And by the time um, I parted ways with this particular client, uh, the trees had doubled in size and we hadn't lost any. It was, it was a stunning turnaround. So as I was working with this client on the front of his house, he also bought the lot next door. And he had a drainage problem. And he said, well, how do I fix this? So we went in and we sprayed the drain uh, for the neighborhood uh, dead. And I realized, yes, I know spray. Um, we were as gentle as possible, one application, and we did it when it was not wet so it wouldn't carry. We took as many precautions as possible, but we didn't really have much of a choice under this particular case. Uh, removing the sod with the, we'll call it the shared um, <laughs> mentality of the neighborhood would have been problematic. So what we did was, is that once this was, once the, once the grass was dead, we left it in place and we planted a mix of about 10 to 15 species of herbaceous plant, uh, three different kinds of trees, four different kinds of shrubs. Now, you may see the big fence there. Uh, there was two reasons for that. One, deer um, are a problem as this property backs up to a state park and we had to keep the deer out. Uh, 
we didn't fence it the first day and we were putting the plugs back in for the next three because they kept on dragging them across the yard because they're, uh, they're jerks. But you know, that's just my humble opinion. And the other reason we had to put the fence in is the neighbors because they would pull out the plugs. And uh, what ended up happening was the neighbors were so upset that he planted wetland plants or wetland tolerant plants because we planted wet tolerant things that we understand there was going to be dry down. So we used species that were uh, accustomed to that dry down, except for the bald cypress because he had a thing and that's why there's a bald cypress in the picture. And uh, they called the state of Illinois and they said, this man is clogging and stopping water with native plant material and it should be stopped because now our neighborhood won't drain. And the state park people came out, uh, the Illinois DNR, uh, he, saw, he saw their truck and he was having his coffee and he goes, oh my goodness, uh, I better go out and see what these guys want. So he walks out and he said, he walked up to the truck, the guys didn't, he goes, they never moved, they rolled down the window and he goes, can I help you gentlemen? And they said, no, we just want the neighbors to see that we came out to look at it. So he goes, keep up the good work because, uh, you know, this way we get cleaner water coming onto our site. And if, you know, and it, he goes, all these plants are native? And they say, he goes, yes. He goes, well, in that way, if they ever set seed and then water carries it into our property, we have native plants that come up too. He goes, it's a win-win for us. But since your neighbors are really upset about it, we want to make sure that we're seen. And they stayed for another 15 minutes and then they left. And that was the last he heard of it. Or so he thought. Uh, there, there was a part, uh, a, a, uh, a neighbor that accidentally knocked down the fence in the middle of the night trying to find a place to pee, but that's a whole other story and it, it's uh, very long and rambling, but mildly hilarious. So what is possible? You can, you've seen from that client that you can go full conversion. You can take out every native, or excuse me, every non-native species and put in a, a completely native bed and make it look as ornamental as anything you could do with ornamental plants. But there's other possibilities. And for those of you that want to kind of explore something like that, you can take out the lawn completely. You can't grow grass, well then don't. You can do a whole lot of things simply by letting, you know, by putting in a path and getting as creative as your mind will carry you. Or maybe, you know, you have a community project. By the way, guess who has goop, uh, goose poop problems? Uh, it would be the guy who says, I want to see the lake, but you have to keep in mind, he's also looking at it from 15 feet above the ground. So, and now he's complaining that goose come up, come up into his yard and poop all over the place. But everybody else who's embraced it, have no geese and they have flowers. They, 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 uh, I'm told they have ducks and everything like that. This was put in by a restoration company, uh, torn out by the neighbor. And now we, you can see the rocks are put there simply because, I don't know, I think people think rocks hold back water. And I guess that works if you're putting in a dam, but if you're trying to put in like a shore up uh, what's called slough, where the water gets up underneath the sod because the sod doesn't have very deep roots and, the, and your lawn slowly marches down into the water. It, it, it's not a, a good concept. You're much better off planting native species that have deep roots that can give you beauty and then just put a dock in if that's what you choose. Or if you have a limited budget, this was a client that had a little alleyway they kept on falling into the alley. Uh, neighbors were complaining that dirt and rock were all falling in. So uh, he built up his uh, retaining wall with the existing rocks and planted the heck out of it with natives. And people would then steal his flowers uh, after, after they started getting big. Or you can go full on crazy and put it on your roof. This is a client of ours who, uh, I enjoy talking to them, but even I think this is a little excessive. Uh, it might be fun, but whew, that takes a lot of work. So, but maybe those, those kinds of concepts, they're a little much and you don't want to do that much. So where do you start? Can be st it can be as easy as 
you know, utilizing a native iris instead of a non-native one, or you know, or, or utilizing a, a native magnolia versus a non-native magnolia. Um, by the way, uh, for those of you that live north of, uh, of 72, uh, of I-72, you're much better off with a native magnolia because when we get those late frosts and ice storms that come through, you don't get the uh, proverbial poop on a stick where the flower bud will open up and then turn brown. It looks terrible. Uh, the native magnolias flower after Memorial Day. And uh, there's uh, quite an interesting palette of those. But maybe that, you know, if you want to go a little bit further by simply not mowing anymore. Well, you can always do a sedge replacement lawn. They've become kind of popular lately and I wanted to touch on them. Uh, this is Carex Pennsylvanica. It is a lovely little colonizing Carex and they kind of, it kind of creeps around and will fill in gaps. And as long as you figure out a strategy, uh, I'm currently just starting one in my yard. I'm going to be knocking out about 500 square feet with this stuff where you put it on a, you, you know, you plant a grid out and you plant them on a grid uh, for lawn replacement. You want to do them on about 14 inch centers, maybe a little tighter. And if you're lucky enough, it'll end up looking something like this. This is the Chicago Park District. Then that is all Carex Pennsylvanica. It is quite stunning and it gets more and more uh, wavy as the season goes on. Carex Pennsylvanica doesn't have the flop that a lot of uh, some of the native woodland Carexes of that size get where uh, like Carex rosea looks big and beautiful and about 1st of July it'll fall in the middle and you'll have a little brown circle but it will come back. This one here tends to stay up for the entire season and you can mow this without doing damage to it. Now I wouldn't but you can. So maybe this is a concept that people can kind of get behind and and not have to worry about maintaining a lawn in the traditional way. Now, if you are interested in using uh, native herbaceous materials, like I mentioned earlier, uh, I tend to work with square feet. Uh, so if anybody wants to take a screenshot of this particular one, I encourage it because it's just some kind of very lazy rules about how spacing works. Uh, the first one here is you take your square footage and divide it by 2.25 and that'll give you your plugs on a roughly 18 inch center. So that'll give you, you know, a nice big gap. So the smaller the number, the closer to number to two you get, the closer to 12 inch on center you get. So that way you can kind of figure out how many plants you need in a general area. Now, that's strictly for, the, for plants you're going to put on a grid. Uh, remember, the space in between, that square that you leave in between, when you're utilizing native plants, say if you're gonna be putting in a big grass bed, if you divide it by 2.25, that'll tell you how many of these particular grass you need to put in. But every square offers an opportunity for you to put in something like, uh, in this particular picture, you can see prairie smoke, you can see shooting star, and yes, I, my mother uh, has uh, forced uh, daffodils upon me, so I, uh, <laughs> it, those things follow me around. I've, thankfully, they're rather benign, but um, you can utilize it. In the back, I don't know if you can see it, um, on the right-hand side next to the bare wood, you'll see a stick, and that is a actually lead plant. So these plants in every square, it opens an opportunity for one or more companion plants to go with it. Um, you know, arrange your plants, like I said, in that grid, and no matter the number, the grass species, uh, you know, make sure that grasses actually dominate the number, not the variety in your plantings, because grasses will cool the site down, especially in prairie style plantings, because all the plants that are going to grow with it are going to come up through the grass. They, that's the way they're, they're wired. You know, they, the grasses will also help maybe keep some of the more aggressive species in check, you know, uh, except when the grasses are very aggressive, watch out for Indian grass. For anybody not familiar with that one, uh, Sargastrum newtons can run very wild, very quickly. So be aware of that one. But when you have an opportunity, even on small plantings, the grasses will soften the bed and they will cool the site and will reduce your need for watering on these species. 
Um, let's see here. Um, uh, yeah. Oh yes, and please remember when you are planting, the green end goes up, the brown end goes down. And uh, I'm not being glib, I've had problems in the past. For those of you, however, looking to plant with woody plants, uh, here's another opportunity. You can take this as a screenshot as well. Um, spacing is the biggest concern when people call me about woodies. How far apart do I put them? And I always tell them, have you ever seen a gnome or a fairy? I'll ask them for it right off. And they'll look at me and they're like, what does that have to do with spacing? And I said, well, if you go to the woods, you look for gnomes or fairies because clearly they're the ones that are moving the trees to the perfect distance apart. They're the ones that make sure that the trees develop properly when clearly it's all nonsense and trees and shrubs, they don't, they don't care. Simply do not care. If two inches, two feet, two yards, it doesn't matter. Uh, frankly, you, you, it only matters in the scheme of things to you as a gardener. It is your taste. Um, I'm, I'm asking maybe don't move to the woods and cut them down because you feel like they need to. Those trees are perfectly ha happy and healthy. It's when you are adding to an environment. If you want to add one when you can fit in three, that is entirely up to you. However, three will fit in the space of one easily. But as a quick rule of thumb, a shrub requires to start the smallest area that I recommend to homeowners is a three by four area. So four to six foot centers. Uh, on very large shrubs, okay, fine, I get it. You're gonna move them further apart, that's fine. But understand the further they are apart, sometimes the less likely it is that they grow together to coalesce. So I always recommend that four to six feet, and especially if you're trying to create a border. Trees, need a little more than 40 square feet, maybe more or less to get started. So, you know, a four by 10 uh, type area. So you can put them on 10 foot centers and they would develop perfectly happy. And some people say, you know, well, how do I arrange them? It, it doesn't matter. And when I say that, um, I want you to take a look at this. This is what I mean about spacing. There are five Baroque oaks on the corner of this house. All of them are planted in such a way that they are outside the, um, the home is outside the circumference of the possibility of that trunk. So in other words, a, a really big Baroque is gonna be a 60 inches across, you know, um, and you know, just for short of six feet. So every one of these is further than six feet from the home but really no further than seven to 10 feet from one another. I have multiples, multiple examples of this. This just kind of struck me as kind of apropos for this talk because people get very, very weird about this. The, the only people who really care about it is the insurance companies. However, uh, if the tree is structurally sound 200 years from now, you're not gonna have to worry about it. These are, perfectly happy this way. I have two white oak bigger than 40 inches that are less than a foot apart from each other. I'm perfectly comfortable, uh, comfortable with them in my yard. They're not going to fall apart. They're not going to hurt anyone. Um, and they developed just fine. So if they're, you know, if anybody is worried about spacing, that is more uh, dealer's choice. Plants don't care. So why convert natives? Why, why convert it all? Uh, some homeowners, uh, they do it for many, many different reasons. Some are, they're tired of mowing. Some of them just want a shade tree that, that is native so they can either feel better about their yard or whatever. But the real reason that we want people to convert to using more and more natives is to support our local environments. Uh, you know, most people think of, uh, by when they think butterflies, they think monarchs, they think milkweed. But oak trees in particular, especially in the Chicagoland area, support more than 400 and some species of Lepidoptera. Now, the ones that you see here, no, uh, these are on different species. The one on the right is on sassafras. The one on the bottom left is on a plant called telia or wafer ash. 
and the one on top is on spice bush. But it's the, it's the use of these native plants that will help bring the crawlers that give us the flyers. And when you have host plants, you also feed into another aspect of it. It's not just seeing that your garden has now come to life with wings and different times of year, different species are going to be flittering around your yard. And you're like, oh, look at that color and look at that color. It's, it's beautiful and it's stunning, but it also feeds into this, the ones that eat them. You know, ca uh, caterpillars and slugs are eaten by, uh, by uh, garter snakes. So don't kill garter snakes, if you, especially if you have a, you know, a lot of slugs, they eat the heck out of those things, especially when they're young. You know, the birds like nighthawks come out at night and they eat the mosquitoes along with the bats here on the bottom right. And what do they feed them to? They feed them to their chicks. So uh, like a family, of, uh, a family of chickadees will feed their chicks to, from, uh, from hatching to fledging to uh, a caterpillar every two minutes from each parent. And I did the math on it once. It was more than 20,000 caterpillars. It's a crazy amount. And they need species that host caterpillars and that and those most successful live in areas where oaks and other native species are utilized as part of the kind of, kind of like gardening lexicon, that native species are more prevalent. You have more songbirds. You have more wildlife interaction in yards. I mean, I had turkey in my backyard. It, it's crazy when you, when you put in these things, that, the kinds of animals that just kind of randomly show up in your life and the interactions that they make possible. And if you don't have any, any native species at all, like that guy who uh, we saw earlier who had the three acres of nothing but mode and then the, the fountain. I mean, the best that that man could hope to have show up in his yard might be a deer and that's only because they're eating the corn. You want to not just enrich your garden with native plant material, but enrich your life with experiences with these native species. Now, if you live uh, much further south, uh, you know, that snake there may bother you a little bit, but trust me, that's not the, you know, no Hershey kisses, it'll, uh, so it's uh, not an adder and everything. So please be aware, don't kill snakes unless you absolutely have to. And, and even then, be, be gentle. But there are other benefits as well from making people realize that native plants have value and they bring the community together for plant sales or putting in a community, uh, going into a community and putting in a rain garden where, you know, native species, this is in, uh, I think this was in Pilsen uh, in Chicago, you have opportunities to bring people into nature and, and show them that they can, they can get their hands dirty and, and embrace the use of natives for a, a positive purchase, a purpose. Or, it can, it can simply be your family for Sunday pictures where native species offer a backdrop that is better than any painting you could ever hope to see. So I, I hope this has helped some people. Uh, uh, I've never done this before. Normally with a, I, I have a very large group of people in front of me so uh, I can kind of gauge uh, how this went over. I'm hoping that this helped and that it was informative. But if anybody has any questions, um, I believe, uh, oh, uh, and since I know what the first question is going to be, that is called the bloody tooth fungus. It is common on red pine uh, in Minnesota, uh, northern Wisconsin, and southern Canada. Uh, and it uh, secretes what looks like blood, but trust me, eh, it's it's like a nectar. The ants really go bananas for it and they carry the spores off to uh, their nests that are next to roots. So I'm, I'm, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Kelsey. We do have some questions here. I've been doing my best to answer some questions that I can answer in the chat, but um, we'll go ahead and get started here. Again, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box. 
um, raising your hand, we really can't do anything with that. Um, and then sometimes the chat just goes really fast and we miss questions there. So um, getting started on the Q&A chat right now, um, how close can Baneberry be planted to edibles ramps, for example? Um, uh, if you, uh, are we, we're, I'm assuming we're, we're talking about uh, the allium, like Cernuum and, and species like that. Um, I, I would assume. It, it, you know, I, I, I don't eat them a lot. I, I, I find them to be very, very, uh, very potent. So if, if you are into them, I, I typically recommend that people kind of keep them uh, at least at arm's length. Uh, but the thing is, is that a lot of the bane berries kind of tend to spread. So if you have them in one part of the garden and you're, you're concerned about it, I would remove them uh, to the other part of the garden where you know you can isolate them from it. Uh, I think I, I read someplace where it had to be like eight feet, but I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd trust that I'd go a little bit further. All right. Um, in a very small garden, is it best to plant in groups or just disperse your plants? My garden's about 50 square feet. Um, and it depends on the look that you're going for. If it's ornamental, then you have a plan. Keeping them clustered together is absolutely fine. Um, so you, you know, if you're, if you're going for, um, you know, more fountain where it comes up in the middle and it, it dips out to the, uh, out to the sides where it's shorter, um, that's good, kind of more of a, uh, can, that's more of a landscaping choice. But if you're just doing a native garden, having them dispersed across the bed and that way you have flowers that kind of wave through uh, particular areas, you probably more successful uh, having small groups uh, spaced around the garden. So if I have one species, I have got put in four of them. I put two here, one here, and one there, where I kind of have them uh, uh, kind of grouped, but not really have some space. And it'll that way your flowering happens in more than one area at one particular point in time for ornamental purposes. All right. Um, we covered this a little bit, but there have been several questions about grass or lawn substitutes. So we okay. mentioned Pen Sedge, Carex pensylvanicus, um, which I did put that in the chat for people who were looking on, you know, to get the spelling on that. Um, but other suggestions that you might have? Uh, it really depends on the height that you're, 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 you're okay with. Uh, Car for, if you want to keep it short, Carex pensylvanica, Carex rosea, uh, Carex radiata, uh, those typically are um, you know, uh, Emorii, I think is, is it Emorii? I think it's Emorii. These are all very, very low ones for at least part shade. Um, when you get into the full sun, you start kind of running into issues because it's hard to keep it short unless you have sandy soil. So like, um, uh, what is it, Buchlo, the buffalo grass. Um, on heavy clay soil, that's a loser, um, you, you, uh, at least in, north, in northeastern Illinois. Uh, I've seen it done successfully out in, uh, out by toward Galena or Savannah, where parts of it just, it kind of takes over. It's, but it's more of a sandy, loamy soil, and you're going to be more successful there if you're trying to keep it low uh, in, in, in more of the heart of that plant's range. If you're willing to go a little taller, um, uh, there's some of the bromuses that do very, very well, and I, and I, I don't know why, but I'm completely flaking on, um, it, it's a broader, I think uh, bromus. I think it's bromus pubescens that I've seen done. Uh, I've seen uh, the uh, bottle brush grass used in this kind of way, but those are taller substitutes. And I don't know how comfortable people are getting taller than say like four or five inches. I'm not a big fan of uh, the um, European um, what are the the nomo fescues. Uh, I, I they get very thatchy and they're, they're, they don't burn as well. So when you're trying to do like run a burn through your, you know, through your lawn to kind of maintain it where the characters will come bounce right back. Uh, it, they, it get, it's, uh, it's not as successful. I mean, I've seen it, you know, I'm sure it's pretty. I'm just not a big fan of, of that particular use. Um, but it really, it, it all comes down to what people are comfortable with is for height. I'm glad you mentioned burning because there was a question too. Someone said they had Carex pensylvanicus in their lawn, but they were getting lots of weeds in it. Okay. So you you can uh, um, if you're getting weed species, um, I'm assuming 
uh, is if that person is still on, if it is um, Creeping Charlie or some other European weed that stays uh, green after frost, you can actually go in and hit it with a flamethrower then. So you can actually, uh, you know, flame it off at that particular point in time. And uh, you can do that uh, a couple of times. That's supposed to help burn them out. Uh, or you can, you know, if you're okay with spraying and you know what you're doing, um, you can go in and spray after frost because it'll stay green and active well into, you know, uh, the first of December and warmer years. That way you're not hurting your native species. All right. But I well, like fire. I'm a big fan of fire. <laughs> you can, if you can set your, if you can set your lawn on fire in the spring and just let it walk across and it, and the woodland carrots is burned at a very, you, it, it, we'll call it a very, a sauntering rate. You can just wander along with it with your flapper and just rail and, uh, and uh, uh, kind of drag it out. It, it, it works pretty well. Um, next question. What do you recommend for beneath maple trees? <laughs> uh, moving. <laughs> uh, actually, I just had a call about that uh, uh, about an hour before uh, uh, the talk started. The, it, it, it depends on the species of maple. If you have sugar maple or black maple or uh, the ones that have, tend to have shallower root systems, uh, non-native like Norway maple or some of the red maples that uh, are supposed to be, you know, they're very heavily used, uh, but they never get big enough for a lot of shade. Um, it's the, it's the sugar, the black, the Norway, they produce a ton of shade underneath their drip line. And first things first, if you can find a way to lighten your crown, to open up some holes that don't structurally damage the plant or hurt its capacity for, you know, healthy living, so to speak, do not never main by the way. Um, but that way uh, you get a little bit of light down on the, on the uh, forest floor and then you can come in with about an inch of compost and that, you know, an inch and you can spread it over the top of your planting area and then come in with uh, uh, things like ferns like uh, uh, the native ginger. Uh, these are really good ground covers that work very, very well under these types of conditions. I love and, wild ginger. And, and, under, and under the native, especially sugar and black maple, even though they put down a lot of shade, um, they don't seem to cause the harm um, that say Norway maple does. Because when Norway maple and a lot of the developed maples, they get what's called root shield. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's an impenetrable, you know, usually six to eight feet out from the trunk. And it's just, it might as well be a table, you know, or a piece of concrete because you can't dig in it. You can't do anything to it. So you have to plant further away from the tree. And getting species into that shade can be challenging. The, ironically, um, or maybe not ironic, coincidentally, as might be better, um, the easiest maple to plant under is silver maple. It, had, it produces the least amount of shade of those types that are used uh, for shade trees throughout the region. And there's more plants that you can grow underneath silver maple than you can underneath the other ones. So you can actually grow things like bottle brush buckeye and uh, spice bush if it's moist. You can grow sambucus so that it actually flowers. So you can do quite a lot underneath silver, but when you're dealing with uh, red, black, you know, uh, sugar, uh, Norway, those are, that's much denser and you need to uh, you make sure that you limit your plant palette and try a couple at a time if you're curious to make sure that it's uh, a survivable situation. But that inch of compost is going to be spread across your planting site is going to make all the difference in the world and you'll have to replenish that every couple of years if you want your plants to flourish underneath and you will always, always have to prune a limb or two out just to get an hour of sunlight underneath there if you're going to have um, long-term stability. And just FYI, uh, Janine Catchpole commented that she likes Carex Gracia. Oh, okay, Gracia, that's nice. Yeah, I like that. And uh, Blanda is another one, Carex Blanda. Uh, it's a very common sedge, a little bit bigger, but uh, I found out the other day you can actually mow that. It comes right back. Yeah, that's what she said too. That it it helps it to look tidy and encourages. Yeah, and, more and every now and then I, I and I get it. You gotta sometimes you gotta mow. 
but I, I, I like the Pennsylvanica because when you mow that one, it's soft. So when you want to go out in your bare feet, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't get pokey like some of the ones that have, uh, the, the more rigid stems and leaves where you're kind of, ouch, it, it, the, the Pennsylvanica and the radiata stay very, very soft. Okay. So early on in your talk, you had that picture of the tree with all the stakes around it. Yes. So, uh, Diana wanted to know what would be a good option for the tree near the road and sidewalk like that. Um, let's see here. You mean, hold on a second here. Uh, this guy, Oop. the parkway, when you come to parkway plant, can you all see this? Yeah. Okay. So when it comes to parkway plantings, um, yeah, it, it, you're looking for, depending on the kind of parkway you have, you've got a nice broad, broad parkway, uh, and you are able to what, uh, you can fracture the soil. Um, anybody that has a, a good potato fork or a good spade, you get down it and you just fracture the soil. You don't turn it. You don't do anything. You just fracture the soil out in a bunch of different directions. It doesn't hurt your sod any. You let the pieces fall back into exactly the same place. You can plant a lot of different species, but when you're on new construction, your palate is somewhat limited. So things like bur oak uh, and chinkapin oak make fantastic street trees. Kentucky coffee tree and swamp white where it's you know, a lot uh, more uh, uh, moist. So you have the gymnocleta stoica and the quercus bicolor there. Uh, I actually like uh, Acer uh, nigra on drier, broader parkways. If you're going to choose a maple, that one has probably the best fall color under these conditions than any of the ones that you're going to be able to find elsewhere. It's tracking them down and getting them in in a size that you're looking for that kind of make it hard. This was a um, it, it was a red maple multiple times and just not a winner. Um, if you're looking for caria species, caria cordiformis, the yellow bud hickory makes a fantastic one. Um, just don't put it over your car and try and steer clear of things like Judlands Nigra uh, or the walnut because um, they hurt when they fall, especially if you happen to get one that has very large production. It, it, it sucks. And I'm, I know I'm forgetting one or two. Oh, uh, in sandier soils or a nice rich loamier soil, uh, Nissa sylvatica makes a very nice street tree, grows very slowly though. Fantastic fall color on that one though. Um, all right, so uh, Rachel says, I'm looking for suggestions to screen a busy road along my side back fence. Soil is moist and somewhat clayey, southern exposure with full sun to light shade. Ooh. Um, Boy, um, wh where does this person live? Um, I don't know. Okay, if they're in, um, if they're in the northern half of Illinois, uh, something like uh, American Plum, uh, nine a combination of American Plum, Nine Bark, and maybe a uh, low canopy uh, tree, small tree, uh, shingle oak. Uh, Carpinus Caroliniana, something like that. That, that. Those are good deciduous options because they get very, very thick and they have a lot of stems that get in the way of, of your visibility. And when you're trying to mass that kind of area out, did you say it was kind of moist? I'm sorry? Yes. Okay. And uh, you might want to include also uh, Nanny Berry, Nanny Berry vi Viburnum, the, the Viburnum lentago. The, the, you're looking for plants that are just going to give you lots and lots and lots of stems. If you're going to go the evergreen route, the problem there is uh, if you loot, if you plant a line of them, like you saw, I think, uh, was it here? It is like this one. Uh, if you lose, a, you know, say four or five in the middle of this, they're, you know, they're not going to catch up in your lifetime. You know, you're going to be waiting a very long, long time. I mean, these were 25 feet tall and replacing them at that, at that size can be very, very costly. So you, you need to be aware that sometimes that's just not it is successful. Uh, I always recommend that if you're going to use an evergreen, you put two or three of them here and there to block like the window of that guy's house who refuses to wear pants or to block out the light that comes in from the corner 
uh, because there's a street light or something like that. And you use them very, very specifically and then use a uh, deciduous bed with lots of stems and flowers and things like that to make one, make it more interesting for me because if I'm just looking at something green, I might as well just put up a fence. And, uh, and that's, the, that's a lost opportunity because if I can put in 10 species and get something nice and big and screening and that grows relatively quickly and I use my evergreens to, for that specific purpose, I have a more successful bed, more interesting bed for the long term. All right. Um, and I hope that was helpful. Yeah. On, uh, let's see, Karen asked, what was the name of the plant for the butterfly garden? I believe this was on the slide where you had this, the five natives, one non-native. Oh, uh, the one that's a Morpha fruticosa. It is the uh, host species for the silver spot skipper. It is a stunningly beautiful plant. Uh, if a little rangy, it's a little rangy, it really is. Uh, but um, if you put it in an area that is uh, depressional and gets flooded a little, uh, it gives, it's almost, I want to describe it as kind of a very lazy palm tree. It kind of, the stems are usually bare at the bottom and then the, the leaves happen uh, up on top uh, and they kind of give it a canopy, um, kind, you know, not unlike a shade tree, only much clearly much shorter. It's an indeterminate bloomer. So the longer it's happy, the longer it'll bloom. And plus it's a nitrogen fixer. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, so it'll actually help uh, fix nitrogen in the soil and it gets these weird nodules. Um, so it's also a host to a, a parasitic wasp that is fed on by things like uh, the downy woodpecker, for example. They like to land on it and you hear them pecking on them all the time. So it's kind of cool as well. But the silver spot skipper, um, the, they'll make a hammock out of the leaves. So they'll tie all the leaves together in a little hammock. And then the caterpillar is green with a bright purple head and two orange spots. And when you poke the, poke the hammock, it sticks its head out and hisses at you. It's kind of hilarious. So I, you get mad at me when I do this, but you gave us the Latin. What's the common name for that one? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think, well, hold on. No, I'm probably lying. Hang on. Indigo bush? I think it's indigo bush. Okay. Indigo that, bush. Sounds, that sounds about right. Okay. Yeah. Or false indigo bush? Indigo bush. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, just not, it's not budley. It's not butterfly bush. I mean, it's weird that I know. It's just false indigo. It's false indigo. There you go. Okay, um, so that a, question, sounds right. <laughs> a question about uh, damage from animals. How, how do you help prevent things like deer rubbing or things digging around the roots of your plants? Okay, um, that's for me, I have squirrel damage a lot. Uh, and actually they killed one of my carpinus. They girdled it, uh, uh, a five inch carpinus and a squirrel girdled my tree. So you're kind of, I know, how, I know the frustration of this. Um, you can use things like you can mix up the hot sauce stuff and spray it on. Uh, typically it's in the spring that it's most critical uh, because things like squirrel and, and uh, chipmunk and stuff are most active coming out and they're setting up territories and they're doing a lot of their damage then because sap is flowing, the buds are starting to green, they're going to be nibbling off a lot and spraying a chemical deterrent that's natural. I mean, you can make it with capsaicin or uh, any number of, uh, uh, of uh, your favorite hot sauces that don't, you know, involve that. But um, otherwise, I've seen all kinds of things done. I've seen people use car batteries with wire um, where they're like, you know, wait for the deer to come through the yard and they flip them on, you know, my personal favorite and the one that used to work for me the best, but this is, I had, I was chewing them off a large piece of property was I would get a cooler of beer and a lawn chair with my Daisy Air Rider BB gun and shoot them in the butt <laughs> just to move them along. Didn't hurt them a lick, just got them going, you know? Uh, so you're not, you know, you're not trying to hurt these animals, but you're trying to create a, a create a negative you know, kind of association with things. And from, you have to reapply this stuff, but uh, the, the spray seems to be the one that works the best. And I recommend uh, that you make your own if you can. And for the love of God, do not get it on you. It burns like you can't imagine for a long time, especially things that you touch after you've put yeah. it together. 
Got so it. make sure you're wearing your gloves. Do not spill it down your back when you throw on your backpack sprayer. Be very careful. This stuff, it, it's um, uh, uncomfortable would be a good way to put it. Okay. But that would be, that's the best way that I've seen. Otherwise, there, if it becomes very problematic, live traps, and then if you're, you know, if that doesn't work the other way. Okay. So next question. Um, let's see, Anonymous says she's a beginner and mm -hmm. is looking for kind of a, a summary of a few key reasons to support native gardening versus conventional modern landscaping or raise awareness for native plants. Um, wow. I'd like to say the webinars that we've been doing are a good way to help raise to, awareness. To help, but I mean, but but by and large, the you know, if uh, it, the concept of native gardening, people think is antithetical to uh, ornamental gardening or conventional gardening, and really, they're no different. It's just the kinds of plants that you use to solve your gardening needs. So if you have a particular need for a flowering plant that gets this big and it, it, it lives great in these conditions. There are a hundred native species to every one ornamental that you could probably utilize for that space and be ultimately successful. So if you're looking for reasons uh, to, to go one way versus the other, um, th the most important thing to remember is that you're not losing beauty. Most people, when they garden, it, there's a bit of vanity in it for everybody. So when you're putting a plant out into the yard, it's because it's pretty and it looks good that you have it. And to support your own vanity, you can use these native plants to solve very complex environmental issues in your yard, as well as have it look amazingly good. And not only that, but you're also feeding into um, a larger concept of local food webs, of butterfly gardening, and you know, if you want to go into rain garden and all that kind of stuff, you, you can utilize these natives to accomplish these goals without using a single ornamental and have it be just as gorgeous, just as functioning, and probably longer lasting than anything that you would be able to do with ornamentals. And the example that I use a lot is my grandfather was a wheelbarrow gardener and he had an English garden. He was very proud of his little English garden. Uh, and in fact, he, I think he got featured in a book because of it. And he had his daylilies and he had, you know, his, uh, 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 his iris and, and myriad other species that I frankly have forgotten and, and a little bit don't care about, but it was a stunningly beautiful garden. The day he died, six months later, that garden was gone. It's not a, but if he had used, utilized native species and gone a little bit more naturalistic, not a lot, just a little, that garden would have probably been able to have been salvageable had we been able to get back to the kind of work that he did. And if you're a wheelbarrow gardener, that's a lot of work. So when you're doing that um, in utilizing native species, they're going to persist longer. They're going to do their work uninterrupted because they're happy where they are and the ornamentals as soon as he passed away the stuff that he had to do to keep them alive and keep them flourishing their support ended right there and they were on a downward trajectory the moment that happened and it's unfortunate but that's the reality of ornamental plants they require that kind of care forever yeah absolutely uh, so we've got several questions about removing some non-native type things. So um, <laughs> things like vinca and lily of the valley. Uh, lily, of, lily of the valley is tough. Um, spray doesn't even kill that. Um, I, there, unfortunately, when it comes to vinca and lily of the valley, I'm, I have found the best way to remove a lot of non-natives is mechanical. And when I say mechanical, it's mechanical one, mechanical two. You know, you're out there pulling and using your shovel and stuff like that. And it's very time consuming and frustrating. Um, I know that on the woody plants, it's easier 
because you can flush cut a lot of them. And if that doesn't kill them, uh, once you flush cut, you can paint the stump with, you, you know, your, your, uh, your active ingredient of choice, but, and not actually have it affect a large area. You can directly apply it and that way you've limited all kinds of exposure. But that that's a, those are much easier to get rid of. It's the herbaceous ones because a lot of uh, non-native invasive species, um, if you leave this much root in the ground, it's right back. So things like vinca, you think you got it under control, and it's like, oh my god, you know, it's where the hell did that group come from? And you know, um, you some of the euonymuses are the same way. That that freaking bind weed. Um, Oh, I've got that terrible in my yeah, head. It, it's, te it's terrible. And trying to get rid of them, you know, I'll sit down and I'll try and clear a six foot square area. It'll take me an hour because you're like tracing these roots down into the ground okay. and trying to pull out as much as possible. And it's, it can be very frustrating and time consuming. Um, I would check with wherever you happen to live. I, I didn't catch who, where that one came from, but wherever you happen to live, I would recommend that you consult um, a, a local applicator that has, uh, we'll call it a, uh, an environmental background. Uh, you know, there are a lot of restoration companies all over the place. And if you're looking for somebody to come in and treat individuals that, that you're unable to get, maybe pay for one application, see how they do that, and then be able to identify those species and then uh, be able to replicate the work after you have been properly brought up to speed on whatever it is that you're supposed to be using. But my best, my best effort, I rarely use spray anymore in my own yard or on a lot of projects. It's simply backbreaking work that just, you know, you get down on your hands and knees and just start pulling weeds. There's nothing really better for it, unfortunately. Uh, let's see. Are chopped leaves a good mulch for native plants? It depends on how finely you chop them. If it's a very rough chop, uh, yeah, because you're looking for air movement. If you, if you make a, a powdery cement mi kind of mixture and you throw it out there, you create vapor barriers and, uh, and all kinds of stuff. Not only that, but if you leave the leaves loose and just very, very, very roughly chopped, uh, things like butterflies and um, um, uh, ma mammals, uh, amphibians, reptiles, they will crawl into that stuff and they will overwinter in those in, the, in that leaf litter. And so it can be very, very beneficial, not just for the trees, but for, you know, your, your local inhabitants as well. I, I like using my oak leaves a lot. Maple leaves are a little bit more problematic. Uh, but if you have a mix, it, it's pretty good. Um, the leaf litter in my yard is typically about, uh, in, the, in the fall, we rake it to about uh, uh, 10 to 14 inches deep into the beds. And it, by spring, it's been knocked down to about six. And by about this time of year, it's about four. And some areas it'll, it'll pile and I'll go in and I'll you just kind of rake it out. Typically the leaves that you do that with will be gone within probably about 10 months, typically. Um, but it uh, depends on uh, how active your, your, you know, your soil is and uh, how much airflow and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of local, you know, things that kind of go into how fast they decay and, and contribute to your leaf law or your uh, leaf litter uh, soil kind of thing. Other mulch suggestions to keep weeds down between newly planted things? Um, the, um, hmm, I, no cedar, no cypress, no dyes. So avoid CCD. Um, you don't, cedar is, uh, has a, it retards the roots. Cypress, they're much prettier as trees than they are as mulch, so don't do that. And dyes, I'm not five anymore. I like my Crayolas in a box that I can color on paper with. Um, and not only that, but they don't decay properly. So what you're really looking for is a nice, just double ground wood chip. And if you're trying to keep weeds down uh, and you want to burn them off, you want about four inches of mulch. The heat in that, it will top 100 degrees as it starts to decay. Um, so you want it deep if you're trying to burn it, burn off like lawn or other, you know, non-native plants. If you're just trying to get, you know, kind of dress up an area and you want your native plants to flourish, you don't want to go any deeper than about an inch and a half to two. And you want to make sure that 
And at the point of contact, it's nice and loose. So uh, mulching when the plants are dormant are, is more critical when you're trying to improve your garden than it would be if you weren't. So you're looking, uh, instead of mulching during the summer or spring, where a lot of people do, you'd be mulching you know, at, the, at the beginning or end of winter. All right. But as um, far as, you know what, as far as like choices, yeah, just a nice double ground wood chip. I mean, that, that's the, usually they're free too. A lot of park districts and municipalities just have piles of them around, especially with all the ash dying. Um, so Lisa asks, I planted wildflowers hoping for the low maintenance results, but weeds take over. How do you take care of wildflowers that are supposed to be low maintenance? <sighs> we touched on this, right? In the talk. Yeah, a little I think bit. So a little. Um, it, it's frustrating. It, and that's why I tell beginners when they put their plant prisons in, and usually uh, beginners start with a plant prison, you have an area in the, in the yard where it's a raised bed or something, and it, they, they put it in there and they expect that, that garden to just kind of flourish and not, I'm done. It's no different than putting in any other garden. And if you're coming with seed and you're throwing seed down, but you have no idea what the seedlings look like, that can be very frustrating because it takes three to four years for a good, you know, maintained seed bed to be flamboyantly beautiful. Um, typically in the second year, you start to see the more, the speedier species show up and the third and fourth year is when your sylphiums and stuff like that start to get big, you know. It, so knowing what you're putting down first is your first step. And so I always recommend for anybody who's just beginning, you pick five or seven species that you can identify, you plant them in an area that you're familiar with and don't lose your tags so that you're maintaining it just like you would any other garden. But once you become comfortable with that, you can start adding plants and growing that area. So it's more of a progressional type planting. But if you're not comfortable with that, I just, I pick some native plants that you like, understand what they are, and add them to your garden as you would any other non-native plant. And that way, uh, you know, you have a place for them. But as far as like maintaining an area where it gets weedy, sometimes you have to identify the weeds versus what the native plants are, because sometimes asters, for example, can be very aggressive. Was mm -hmm. it Trundia that can go, uh, you know, completely bonkers? Um, and, uh, you need to be aware that certain native species can be very aggressive right off the bat, but typically fall back over time as other species start to take over. So if you're not familiar with them, uh, I recommend just a small blend to start that you can identify and working your way out from there. All right, Peggy wants some suggestions for a small urban yard. We showed a lot of pictures of larger suburban lots, but- what Oh, well, you, you know- um, Smaller. A small, like a small, this one right here, uh, this, this one right here, this lot is only uh, 50 by 75 uh, in the backyard. So, I mean, it is really, uh, it's your level of comfort. Um, great plants, it depends on the site, like I was saying. So if you have shade, mayapple, that, that's a, it's a beautiful plant and it lasts a good portion of the year, but then it starts to fade out. So you're looking to maybe big leaf aster and you can see the red, uh, red trillium here in the foreground. So you have lots and lots of options, but typically if you're in, if you have a full sun yard, you have more options than you do when you're in a shade yard. Uh, if you're in a shade yard, typically by July, most of the ground plants have, have kind of started to fall back. And that's why they call them ephemeral. They're, they're, they're here and then they're, they've moved on. They'll be back next year. It's like they visited your yard rather than actually live in it. So I love ephemeral. You know, you, you want to make sure that when you, uh, oh boy, if I knew about her yard, I could, I could speak more competently to it. But it, there is no improper plant as long as it's cited correctly. So as long as you, you've identified all your conditions, there is, there's no limit to the use of whatever native you happen to want to have in your yard as long as it's appropriate for where you live and the site that you have. 
So I, I'm, I'm hoping, I know that's kind of ambiguous. I'm sorry, Peggy, her name was Peggy? Uh, yes, I think so. I, I'm sorry, Peggy, but yeah, I mean, it, it really comes down to knowing your site as best you can. And then that way, um, once, the, once you've identified your conditions, you can build from there and you can go in almost any direction you want. Again, as long as, you know, things like regionality, you know, the source material, you know, it's just the little nuances that go into it, but there is probably nothing out of bounds as long as your site has been properly identified. I mean, right. there's some stuff that gets big, but you know, that's more taste. So I, I know we're running a bit long here. Um, just real quick, in your last slide, you had the picture of the boy and the girl sitting in some plants. Uh, yes, yes. Hold on, I'll pull it up. Is that what I think that is? Yeah, it's what you think it is. Uh, that right there is Spring Beauty. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. And um, it's a wonderful little plant. Um, it likes high, uh, high oak canopy shade. I just took a great shot of this the other day, and I can't find it. Um, my apologies. But... Um, you can plant it in your lawn. You know, you can take the seed for it and scatter it as long as your grass is a little on the thin side and you just don't mow it until after the plant has finished setting seed. And it will go, it'll come up every year just like that as long as you have high canopy oak shade or any high canopy shade for that matter, that there's enough light that gets, this, uh, gets to the ground level in the spring. And it doesn't matter if you have shrubs on the ground level or not. All right. Um, it's quite lovely. I think we'll, we'll, we have so many more questions to go, but we'll, <laughs> we'll finish up with two that I know have been really popular. Uh, the first one is a lot of people have issues with salt, road salt, sidewalk, yeah. driveway salt, yeah. any salt tolerant plants you can recommend. Uh, depending on the site, salt travels, uh, depending on the speed, uh, I know on at highway speed, salt travels up to 300 yards. And it's crazy. Um, so they can be a lot of very damaging. Um, so you're looking for plants that, um, oh, that's kind of difficult. On residential streets, most plants are okay. You know, things like yellow wood and um, um, uh, we'll call them the more ornamental natives probably aren't great choices out on the street, but you know, uh, but on, on typical residential streets that are less than 30 miles an hour, you could probably plant almost anything as long as the, the parkway is, you know, bigger than this, you know, so if you have a tiny little parkway, you, you have other issues, but if you have a standard parkway, you can get away with nearly anything. If you're on a higher speed road, anything over 45 miles an hour, things like Burr Oak, um, start to get um, um, witches brooms and you can see that they react very, very poorly. So you're looking for things that have like sunken buds and tend to be more uh, durable, like American plum. If you want to screen the road, that, that grows fantastic. It'll, uh, sumax, uh, shag, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, shingle oak, things like that. They're, they're much more durable up against the road. Um, will, some of the willows and dogwood do very well, not flowering dogwood or pagoda. I'm talking about like blue fruit, gray dogwood, um, uh, the rough leaf dogwoods, things like that, that will be much more tolerant of high speed salt. Uh, otherwise, on a typical residential road, you could grow almost everything except for your overly ornamental uh, native trees. Uh, the best one really is Catalpa. Uh, and that's semi-native throughout much of the range that is listening to me uh, tonight. But that tree, that and Hackberry would grow on the moon upside down. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you could yeah. get away. And again, Hackberry is pretty much the, throughout the entirety of the Midwest. It's all over the place. But, um, and, and there's several different forms of celtis. So uh, there's lavagatus, there's occidentalis, there's uh, tenuif tenuifolia, tenuifolia. So um, there's a hackberry for everybody, but, um, you know, uh, and catalpa as well. And, and look, there's a couple of oak species, especially in the, um, well, I guess you could call them scrub oaks, like uh, Quercus imbricaria or the shingle oak can definitely handle 
uh, those types of conditions. The ones that can't have the, the longer window, white oak, red oak, they get their butt kicked. Um, you know, uh, bur oak grows, it'll grow in it, but it gets witch's broom. So it gets kind of weird. So you want to make sure that, um, you, you know, you kind of uh, manage your palate when you have those types of conditions. If you're just on a resi street, though, go, go nuts. You can do just about anything. All right. And finally, just because I've seen this, I've gotten this question, I've heard it a few times, um, septic fields. Hmm. Can you plant over septic fields with native plants? All right. There's two, th there's two answers to that. Yes and don't. <laughs> okay. Now I've seen both. That's why I wanted to ask. Oh, you. No, no. Well, the answer, the answer is exactly that though. Can you? Yes, you can. Absolutely. Should you? No. Yeah. Uh, and the reason is, is because if you have a problem with your septic field and they have to dig it up, the tree's got to go. So uh, if you're going to do like a perennial planting or something, anything, if you, they have to get to that septic field because you got issues, then yeah, you got to, you got to move it. Now, <laughs> I get a lot of questions like this, uh, especially pertaining to septic fields. For every foot of height of a tree, the roots tend to be out, tend to be two to five feet. So if your tree is 100 feet tall, there's a possibility that the roots are out up to 500 feet. Are they? I don't know. Can they be? Yes. So if you think planting a tree six feet off the edge of a septic field is gonna keep the roots out of the septic field, you're out of your mind. So you understand that the tree is in the septic field. The same thing with foundations. The only reason you have trouble with tree roots in your foundation is because the tree goes, hey, look, I found a crack in your foundation. I'm being a good neighbor and I'm gonna tell you all about it. You know? So you have to understand that it's not so much that the tree's really the one with the problem. Uh, the septic field, don't plant on top of it because of the necessity of maintaining it, okay? But can you plant immediately off the side of it? Yes. And they're like, oh, no, you can't do that. You can't plant within 20 feet of it. If you have even a 20-foot tall tree, those roots are in the septic field. And the reason they're there is there's air, there's water, there's food. You know, there's, oh, look, there's gravel bed that gets intermittent water and whatever this tasty stuff is, yummy. It goes right after that. So you're not, you know, you're not going to keep them out of there, you know, realistically. So just understand that you can, but don't. And the same thing with your foundation. The only reason you have a, you know, the tree didn't crack your foundation. You had a cracked foundation already. It's, if so when the tree's out in your yard and it's, re, you know, putting a root through the side of your cellar wall, just be aware that it's just being a good neighbor saying hello. <laughs> and then does the same hold true, though, for flowers and things like that? Everything. Well, no, and again, it's only the necessity for maintaining it. Okay. Frankly, I, 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 it's the one place in my yard where I will forever maintain a lawn simply because it's not worth it. Yeah. You know, it could it could it cause a problem because a lot of native species have very thick, like, you know, tap type roots. Yeah, it could potentially, but if you're in a porous soil and you have a good your 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 field solidly built, yeah. I mean, if I wanted to plant like a like a sedge like replacement lawn over the top of it, yeah, I'm, it's absolutely fine. Am I gonna put shrubs in the middle of it? No. Simply because if I ever have to maintain it or the potential for a problem to occur, I want to avoid it if I can. All right, with that, I think we're gonna to have to wrap up here. I know there's a whole bunch of open questions still that we weren't able to get to, and I do apologize for that. We had so many people here in the room, it was hard to get to all of them. Um, big thanks to Kelsey Shaw for joining us here, Possibility Place. I wanna put a plug in too. Um, those of you who are wondering, what can I plant in shade? What can I plant in sun? Possibility Places website as a fantastic plant finder. So yeah. you can put in your conditions and it'll spit out a list of plants that'll fit that area. Now keep in mind that is only plants that we grow. So, you know, there are more, but it's the ones that we offer. We also offer mail order. So if anybody is um, within the range and looking for, for plant material um, to be mailed to their door, uh, we do offer a lot of those plants in the plant finder uh, via mail order. 
So um, if we weren't able to get to your question and you know, you're still dying to know the answer, please feel free to email me. I will do my best to get the answer to you as quickly as possible. Um, jvbach at theconservationfoundation.org is my email. Um, again, um, check out our uh, website, theconservationfoundation.org. Uh, tons and tons of information on there as well. So um, again, thank you to Kelsey. Thank you all for sticking with us this long. I hope you all enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. I know I sure did. And so with that, we will wrap up. So thanks again. And we hope to see you all back here Thursday at one o'clock for our- um, um, Yeah, thank you for everybody. For who, everybody that's still on, thank you so much for coming out and listening to me. Sorry, this is my first time on one of these and I'm hoping it wasn't clunky. No, you did great. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. How do I leave this thing now? I'll do it.